Thank you. We will now be moving on to session one of the high-level corporate dialogue, which is on the corporate sector role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, to moderate this session, we have with us Ms. Kaylee Kreider. Ms. Kreider works at the intersection of technology, politics, policy, and communications with a special devotion to work in areas of climate change and energy in the US and around the world. She has traveled to every continent in her work as a consultant, an NGO leader, and as an advisor to former Vice President Al Gore. Kaylee works as a consultant primarily on projects related to climate change, energy science, and technology. She serves as special advisor for climate science to the United Nations Foundation, works with National Geographic's Pristine Seas Program, and several private philanthropies. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to invite uh, our other panelists to come up, and in the interest of time, since I understand we're about 15 minutes behind, I'm not going to read all of their biographies, but as they're coming up, I will tell you just a little bit about them. Um, Jake Schmidt is here. He directs the International Program at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Bill Sisson is here, who directs sustainability at the United Technologies Corporation. Raymond Victory is here. He's listed as the senior advisor for the Albright Stonebridge Group, but of course he goes back a long way. I remember him from the Clinton-Gore administration and he did seminal work uh, with uh, U.S.-India relationships and the corporate sector. Um, Thomas Weber is here, president at Jupiter Oxygen Corporation. Um, I'm sorry to say that Dr. Malti Gold cannot join us today, but she did um, submit some comments, um, which I'll make sure to incorporate as we go through today. And finally, Lisa Jacobson, who I'm so thrilled to see, who's president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. Um, each of our speakers um, wanted to, we wanted to give them a chance to give a few opening remarks, and then we thought we would take some questions from the room to make this a bit more interactive. So I'm going to go, um, if it's all right, in the, in the order that they are listed here, but um, please save up your questions and we'll try to, um, to open it up even with the limited time that we have. So I'm going to start with you, Jake. Um, I think that there are some microphones here, or you can come up to the podium, whichever you prefer. I prefer to sit. I'll keep it informal. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, you know, as we are headed into uh, a very big moment on the international climate stage, um, I think <clears throat> I, for one, have been sort of reflecting on kind of where we're at um, and where we need to, to head going forward. Um, so I think it's important to sort of step back. We, we used to be headed for a five degree Celsius world. That was a sort of pre-Copenhagen estimate of where the climate scientists um, were predicting that we were headed, some even uh, much higher than that. <clears throat> um, anybody that knows climate science knows that a five degree Celsius world is a very scary place to be. Coming out of Copenhagen, uh, we have commitments that are putting us on the best estimate of about a 3.6 degree Celsius world, which is, uh, much less scary than a five degree Celsius world, but pr still pretty scary. It still means droughts and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> the kind of current targets that countries have put on the table as we go into Paris uh, put us uh, potentially on about a three degree Celsius world. That's kind of the estimates that are coming out. There's some other countries that will come forward, I think, in the next couple of days, including India. Uh, the recent, latest rumor is sometime this week, so we'll have to see uh, coming forward. <clears throat> but what that means is that we're not yet on a three degrees Celsius world, um, or a two degrees Celsius world. We still have a, a gap in terms of where uh, the world uh, needs to head. And it is critical that we close that gap for lots of reasons that I'm sure everybody in, in this room knows uh, coming forward. And I think there's a number of factors that, at least for me, give some optimism that, that we can actually uh, close the gap. And there is a critical role for companies in each of those pieces. <clears throat> One is that, um, you know, I think to five years ago, you could honestly say that 
uh, countries couldn't, <clears throat> the renewables maybe could compete, but not maybe everywhere. Uh, I think it's more and more true now that as a country looks to build out its energy future, it can do that much more sustainably on the back of uh, renewables and energy efficiency. The cost has dropped significantly over the past five years, and, and the, all the estimates now are that it's going to drop in even more, <clears throat> and that's not just Jake Schmidt from NRDC, you know, environmental advocate, that's Citigroup and sort of financial estimates uh, from some of the leading uh, banks around the world are saying that that's true. The second piece <clears throat> is that company or countries have started to put in place the foundations of policies in, in many uh, places. A um, couple, you know, 10 years ago, very few countries had some sort of renewables policy, and now there's about <clears throat> uh, 164 countries that have um, some sort of feed-in tariff, some sort of mandatory uh, renewable mandate, and so forth. And what that means is that there's a growing and huge market uh, created both, you know, in developed countries like, the, you know, sunny Germany. Uh, but also in places like India, China, Chile, Mexico, and so forth. And so there's obviously a huge uh, opportunity to drive forward kind of policy solutions in, in some of these key countries. <clears throat> and I think the, the last piece, um, <clears throat> and this is sort of a unique piece that's starting to emerge this year, is that we're starting to see, I think, a set of commitments from cities, states, and companies that hopefully will drive and help to, to close some of that gap. So you have some of the biggest players in the deforestation space making commitments. You have some countries committing to go to 100% renewables. So there's a huge opportunity for the companies to play sort of a critical role in helping to drive down some of these uh, policy solutions in these places. So um, with that, I think I'll stop because I know we're short. Thank you, Jake. And you remind me when you talk about the implications of the degree change that when I when I used to work for Vice President Gore, he would always say to me, what does Dr. Ramanathan think? What does that mean? When are we going to hit two degrees? So you remind me uh, of our prior speaker, uh, just how, how much foresight he's helped us to gain in this area. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Bill Sisson, who directs the sustainability program at United Technologies. I didn't realize I was next. Um, well, I'm going to sort of represent the, the theme of the, the, the discussion, I guess, is the, the corporate role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I, I have kind of a dual philosophy on, on this, uh, this particular item. First is kind of a mantra I've developed um, with some colleagues at the World Business Council. Uh, we, we refer to it as business taking action and business leading action. And the taking action part is really a commitment that many corporations around the world are taking and making on reducing their uh, environmental footprint. Uh, in particular, I speak about my company, uh, United Technologies. Since about the early 1990s, we've really uh, taken an earnest commitment to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and our environmental footprint. And we've done this by the way business does things. We, we set goals, we make commitments, and we adhere to those commitments. And the penalties for not adhering to commitments are, as you would expect in corporations, or performance reviews and things like this. And, you know, you don't want to have a negative outcome. And so for the last quarter century, we've been driving down our energy consumption and our greenhouse gases um, uh, significantly. And by, by that I mean uh, in, the last, in that last 10 years so period, our growth has tripled nearly. And now that may change next year if you follow the company. Um, but uh, our overall absolute uh, consumption is down by 20 percent. That's, you know, so to accomplish those, uh, those types of objectives, it takes commitment and it takes a certain degree of, of effectiveness at, at knowing where and how to reduce your footprint. Um, having said that, the business leading action part is really how we take that experience and that, that outcome uh, to, to the broader audience uh, called the marketplace. And so with organizations like uh, World Business Council or the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, where we join up with other corporations and can, can allow ourselves to collaborate together to solve some of these structural issues that address uh, others that are having an issue or a difficulty meeting those same types of outcomes or, or those same types of performance uh, benefits that we're able to realize. So business taking action, business leading action. It's about making commitment and doing it yourself and then it's about taking that know-how and experience and bringing it out to the market and helping others to do it as well. 
Thank you, that was great. Uh, next, we'll hear from Raymond Vickery. Thank you very much. I'm glad somebody remembers the Clinton Gore administration. That's great. I, I'm, I'm old enough. It's, it's the <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. You're very young. I'm not. Um, I am happy to be here uh, today. Um, and we just have a few minutes. Um, I want to uh, emphasize one point in regard to corporate and private sector, and that is uh, that the days of government being the driving force uh, in meeting energy and climate change are over. The model that has too often been assumed uh, in U.S.-India relations has been the Green Revolution aid model. And that model uh, has little or no relevance uh, because there simply are not the resources or political will to do it. In terms of the professor's uh, numbers, about uh, $450 from the uh, top uh, uh, billion uh, and 250, that money is not going to come through government to government action. Uh, maybe it should, but it won't. And so it is up to the corporate sector to figure out how to fill this gap and how to work in public-private partnerships, something that we emphasize very much in the Clinton-Gore administration, uh, to be able uh, to do this. Uh, one of the ways is uh, the way in which a uh, previous speaker has indicated. Uh, I'm reminded of something that my wife is the general counsel of something called uh, the CE Ro uh, Roundtable on Cancer. Uh, and has a gold standard that is set up to uh, have uh, smoke-free campuses and so forth, and it has made a, a measurable impact. And that's part of the story as to how corporations particularly can be uh, emphasized. I'd like to talk about one other just for a minute. I do work for the University of Texas uh, at Austin uh, in what they call their IC Square Institute which is innovation, creativity, and capital. And what it does is it takes um, the model of being able to take innovation incubators uh, and applies it uh, directly to the clean energy problem, particularly uh, they've been working in India for some time. And what it does uh, is use uh, resources from universities uh, in conjunction with a network of uh, NGOs, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, and private sector to be able to adapt technology to make it uh, viable commercially and to get it into the market. And I think that this is an area in which if you're talking about what happens in India, which is really great promise, because the fact is there are a lot of technologies around which are very useful, but they aren't going to get spread by governmental action. They're only going to be get spread by commercialization in a way in which a technology uh, which could be useful in a U.S. urban setting can be adapted, for example, for villages, uh, can be uh, adapted uh, for uh, the urban uh, poor situation. And to me, that is an extremely promising way in which the private sector uh, and corporations in public-private partnerships with academia, non-governmental organizations uh, can make a very significant contribution. Thank you. Um, next, Mr. Weber, would you prefer to come up to the podium? Perfect. Thank you at this point also, Terry, for putting this extraordinary event, uh, very timely event together. Jupiter Oxygen Corporation is a US-based clean energy technology company with representative office in China. We are specialized on oxycombustion technology with applications in industrial furnaces and oxycombustion-based carbon capture from natural gas and coal-fired boilers. As presented in the carbon capture track this morning, the challenge for successful greenhouse gas emission reduction is Asia's dependence on coal for growth. The International Energy Agency is projecting in their central scenario that roughly three quarters of primary energy use 
will be still fossil fuel based in 2040. If you want sustainable growth for all, you need to find a way to clean up fossil energy and to effectively control carbon emissions and air pollution from coal combustion. The good news, technologies have been developed that can capture the carbon from fossil fuel power plants and industrial sources and allow for turning the carbon into a commodity. Co-benefits of those technologies can be air pollutant control, water recycling, heat recovery, and many more. Carbon capture, CO2 utilization, and reuse is a game changer if those technologies can be established at scale. Now, the cost of those technologies are still high. The latest EIA report on projected costs of generating electricity states that cost of, electri of electricity from coal-fired generation is ex expected to increase by 30 to 70 percent due to the addition of carbon capture technology that are currently available. The report also states that by 2030, these cost markups could decline through learning effects to a range of 25 to 40 percent, assuming a deployment level of around 100 gigawatt of coal-fired carbon capture plants. Now, how do we get to this clean coal expertise at scale, maybe even in India or China? A study done by Advanced Resources for Jupiter Oxygen assessed the basins in India that are currently producing coal bed methane or have CBM development planned. These areas account for nearly 10 trillion cubic feet of domestic CBM resource in place. About one fourth is estimated to be recoverable from application of primary CBM. One fifth, in addition, could be recovered from eCBM enhanced coal bed methane recovery with CO2 injection. Approximately 800 million metric tons of CO2 storage capacity could exist in those unmineable coal seams. The requested injection gas can be sourced from man-made CO2, um, like coal-fired power plants or industrial plants. Up to 10 gigawatt of coal-fired boiler capacity is needed, assuming 15 or 20 years of carbon capture from those boilers. Revenue from CO2 in oxy combustion, also N2, sold to EZBM sites will reduce carbon capture costs significantly. In return, the value of the additional domestic EZBM resource, depending on natural gas price, could be 8 to 16 billion US dollars. In conclusion, cost effective carbon capture technology, CO2 utilization, integrated project structure, cautious site selection, and other synergies are key for a successful demonstration and implementation of much needed carbon capture projects in India. Integrated carbon capture and CO2 utilization or reuse projects will attract industries such as coal, the gas and oil, and the utility industry because they will be being profitable. And India has the CO2, India has the CO2 utilization market opportunity with eCBM and an enhanced oil recovery to establish carbon capture as key technology for addressing greenhouse gas emission reduction and air pollution control while growing based on coal. Thank you so much. And I wish Dr. Goel were here because uh, her remarks were going to be about low carbon growth strategy in the cement sector and uh, in particular trying to look at um, the role that carbon capture could play in, in uh, emissions from uh, cement, the share of which is about 5% globally. So my apologies that she's not here to share those remarks with us. So um, Lisa, we'll let you conclude. Lisa Jacobson, President of Business Council for Sustainable Energy. Thank you, Kaylee. And I also want to thank Terry. It's an uh, excellent convening today, and I'm very pleased to share a little bit about the Business Council for Sustainable Energy with you. And in particular, I was asked to talk about how our industries engage in the international climate negotiations as well as the broader discussions on climate change. And I think at the core, discussions like this, the U.S.-India summit, are about public-private partnership and are about building sustainable markets for clean energy technologies and other climate solutions. And as we move through the political and policy processes, at the core, it's going to be those partnerships that are going to be enduring and help implement whatever policy decisions are made at other levels. 
I also want to acknowledge two board members of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy that are the lead sponsors of this event, uh, United Technologies Corporation and Jupiter Oxygen Corporation. Your leadership uh, in this summit is, is commended. And I wanted to just comment on two things I heard, one from the professor and one from Bill as I made my brief comments. The first was from the professor. Uh, when I started in this field and the council uh, was founded in 1992, uh, you know, not too long ago, but a few decades ago, the concept of having commercially available technology on the ready and having it be economically viable were not well understood. And probably the data didn't support it in the way that it supports it now. But that's the reality that we're in. And we've seen dramatic changes in technology cost and in deployment trends and new business innovations. So we're really in an entirely different world than we were just a few short years ago when we think about energy efficiency, when we think about renewable energy, when we think about clean fossil fuel technologies. It's really a, a totally different landscape. I also wanted to mention um, a comment on Bill's thought about the role of the business community both in terms of taking action within the corporate sector and internal activity and then bringing that to the marketplace. I would add to it, there's also now the opportunity for engagement and sharing best practice in a way that we haven't seen before because we have these new experiences, we have better data, and we can tell the economic story in different ways we could a few short years ago. So my second uh, set of remarks relate to the process that the Business Council for Sustainable Energy takes in the international climate negotiations. And we are not there on our own. There are other leading business groups like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and other industries that want to share their perspective on how to cost effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We go there to share economic information about our technologies, to share what effective policy pathways might be, and to urge for uh, strong signals from policymakers that clean energy investments are the direction that the financing sector should take. And we will be at COP21 in Paris as well a number of other business groups, again, to offer our expertise to be a constructive resource in that process. And that's not new for uh, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. In fact, the first thing it did when it was founded in 1992 was to go to the Earth Summit. And there were not as many businesses there at the time, and I'm happy to say that the business sectors across the world you know, are increasing their engagement with the climate change process. But for this audience, I would encourage emerging economy businesses need to be at the table. And we strive to uh, take these discussions here and work with businesses that are present and encourage them to engage with us in the dialogue with their own political leaders about how to cost effectively uh, address the climate challenge. My last point would be about economics and data. We have found that with the rapid change that's occurring in the United States, we wanted to document that well year after year for policymakers, other industry participants, and other stakeholders. So we've partnered with Bloomberg New Energy Finance to create an annual fact book of the U.S. energy sectors with a specific focus on climate solutions, energy efficiency, renewable energy, natural gas, clean fossil. It's all in there. It's all available for free. We have some materials on it here, our infographics. Uh, we also have a brochure, so it'll be available you know, at the desk if you want to look at it. But you can see what's happened and would have been unimaginable just a few short years ago in terms of deployment and cost reductions for many technologies. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. I know we want to take a few questions from the audience, but I'll kick it off just by asking you all, and you all don't all have to answer, but um, I'd love to know, uh, I'm, I appreciate that 1992 wasn't that long ago. That makes me feel really good. <laughs> and I'm sure the rest of us, what do you think are the most promising things that you, changes that you've seen in corporate leadership over the course of the time that you've been involved in the climate issue? In other words, is it a technological change? Is it a particular partnership that has lit the way? Um, is it uh, w you know, a, a particular um, political mind shift? Um, do you have an example that you think would really um, highlight something that, that might also particularly illuminate um, the US-Indian relationship or be something that you know, we could apply to what we're talking about here today? 
I'll start, uh, and uh, this goes back to uh, Al Gore's uh, theme about um, uh, that uh, pollution is the uh, footprint of inefficiency. And I think among corporate leaders, uh, that gospel has been adopted, uh, whereas um, uh, 20 years ago or so, um, that wasn't the way it was looked at, it was how much can we make in terms of incremental activity. And now, the efficiency part of it is extremely important in terms of what happens to the bottom line. I think that that's a sea change. Uh, if I could just reinforce that. I you know, I go back when, when the, the whole system was introduced for my company, and it really uh, stemmed from the voice of leadership. It really stemmed from the CEO's office itself and, and, and driving the, the programs in a way that, that really felt like it was, A, important for the direction of the company, and B, it enhanced the profitability of the company. The messages are very strong. And, and so that's, that's my story, but I think as I've been out sort of doing the business leading action part, um, there, there's clearly a common story that I see about, about this, which is more or less the same. We see the, the voice of leadership is really driving the sea change. It's, it, there, is a, you know, there is a modest amount of grassroots level activity out there, but when, when it's directed from the top, and when Gerald Hines, for instance, drives his building portfolio agenda with energy efficiency in mind, things happen. And so I think that's really an important aspect of how things have changed in the last 20 years from my perspective. I want to uh, report on an in-house uh, example. Our CEO, Dietrich Koss, is here and he started actually the Oxic Fuel Combustion Technology Development back in his aluminum plant, Jupiter Aluminum, in 1992, 1994, when natural gas prices kept rising. He thought about of a more efficient way to remelt aluminum, which led to uh, oxy combustion implementation and which reduced his fuel uh, costs by 70%, uh, net 50% if you account for the oxygen that you have to produce, but you can halve your energy bill. That's uh, quite an achievement now. All of that led to very intense work together with the US Department of Energy and National Energy Technology Laboratory. Uh, USD grant that where we then could establish a uh, 15 megawatt uh, uh, oxy conversion uh, boiler that showcases carbon capture from uh, coal fired or natural gas fired power plant and so forth. So now we are sitting here thinking about ways of applying the technology in India and China. Uh, we are regularly uh, with the business council as delegates uh, at the COPs and the climate negotiations in order to spread the world, what you can do with based on technology and energy efficiency and based on carbon capture and uh, take it from there. If you have a question, raise your hand. I have a friend with a microphone back here who can um, bring it to you so that you can be heard. Dietrich Kors. Uh, good afternoon. We have heard about the California experiment and uh, results, which are so far very stunning, if the percentages are correct. My question would be, do you think, or if anybody thinks of you, that that can, applied, can be applied worldwide, uh, and in what time frame, and with what discipline? Very simple question. Well, I'll give you my, uh, my answer is no. Uh, the fact is that uh, it, with a state, you have one polity, one government. Uh, in, that, in the California instance, you have a majority politically that is, stands behind that. That is a completely different situation uh, than you have worldwide in terms of how you could meet that. Uh, and particularly in regard uh, to India, uh, it's not a question of being able just to transfer resources uh, within India to be able to do this at a, at a government mandate. And that's the reason that I believe uh, that the private sector in public-private partnerships has to play a leading role as opposed to uh, a government mandated approach to it. I mean, one, <clears throat> not to disagree, because I think I'd come at it sort of a slightly different angle. I think the, <clears throat> you know, as I said, one of the main differences now is that 
Um, you know, if you're a country building an energy infrastructure, and we see this in lots of places around the world, it's not, it's not so obvious that you need to choose, you know, a coal path or a natural gas path when the cost of renewables is much more competitive today. And when, you know, what California did, some of which <clears throat> it did when the cost of solar was very high, especially compared to today. Uh, and so California is kind of leaping to the next level, but I think there's a huge opportunity, uh, you know, for countries around the world to do, you know, something similar. Different politics, different contexts, et cetera. You can't just, you know, kind of copy the California model, um, <clears throat> you know, everywhere. But I think there is, you know, a huge opportunity. We found, you know, we find it in, you know, in a place like India. There's a huge, uh, large number of jobs that can be created as India meets its solar goals. We did a study uh, earlier in the year that sort of sh documented that. Uh, you know, and if you think about um, the sunniest spot in Germany is uh, not as sunny as anywhere in India, um, you know, and we know the cost of, you know, the German example is not always perfect, but, you know, India has a huge potential, lots of, uh, lots of solar, and, you know, given the, the objectives that the, the Prime Minister has set out, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity to do that, and the fact that, you know, uh, shockingly, he's going to Silicon Valley to try to talk to some of those uh, people with money and, and technology. Uh, is you know not a, a huge surprise in, in the sense of what he's uh, trying to do. So I think there is some examples of how India can not replicate the California model because it's different, but can actually you know do the kinds of <clears throat> grow the economy and do it in a, a way that doesn't drive you know environmental damage uh, you know in a potentially uh, sustainable uh, fashion. Uh, the, I guess just to add to the comments, I don't disagree with anything that's been said, is, is when, I, when I look at California's program, um, specifically in the area of energy efficiency initiatives, I find they're developing a lot of practices that are potentially transportable. So what we have to do is carve out those mechanisms that are going to work in other locations, that are working well in, in California, use California as kind of a best practice example and try to adapt those structures to other parts of the world. Um, and so in, in, in particular, I think this is, a, this is the, the benefit of having a, a leading state like California pushing ahead their agenda, as they did with auto emissions 20, 30 years ago, and as they will continue to do, I believe, in this space. So it's a best practice example that I would, I would try to capture from California and move it uh, to other markets around the world. If you could raise your hand if you have a question, and while we're waiting for that, I'll say that the World Bank came out with an interesting report. If you could bring the microphone over here, please. Uh, the World Bank came out with an interesting report today looking at price on carbon initiatives uh, around the world, and they have a very interesting repository that looks at the various regimes and how they worked, and in some cases how they haven't, that I think is interesting because it's global in its reach. Go ahead. This is the U.S.-India Energy Partnership Summit. What should the U.S. or India do to accelerate the, the great things that you're talking about? And if you could each, this won't be the only thing they can do or even the best thing they could do, but if you could each just give one example. Spoken like a true former Hill staffer that you are. <laughs> At least it wasn't a yes or no. <laughs> um, I would say convening. I mean, I think convening and dialogue among business and policy leaders from both nations is critical because there's so much work to be done and it was already pointed out. I mean, the business sector in, in India, the business sector in the United States are gonna need to work together for both of our countries to be able to meet the goals that, that we're setting. Well, I think you have to have a financing mechanism uh, that will work for both sides. Uh, as I indicated earlier, it's not going to be on a USAID kind of transfer model from the U.S. Uh, to India. Uh, on the other hand, India can't uh, do this uh, with tariffs which are not reflective of uh, economic reality. Uh, there has to be, uh, there is the demand there, there is the ability to pay for it, there is gold at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, but there have to be some innovative uh, financing mechanisms that was suggested today in a, uh, one of our outbreak uh, programs, which Charlie Evinger uh, uh, chaired, uh, that uh, an OPIC uh, backstopping, government uh, backstopping to uh, be able to uh, use governmental financing in a creative way I think that that's absolutely necessary, and uh, it's, uh, I hope, what people are talking about today 
uh, in the energy dialogue because unless we can uh, ba break that uh, conundrum, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. In, in our case, it's uh, very specific, again, related to carbon capture technology. We need a CO2 utilization market. Now, the U.S. has a lot of experience and expertise on CO2 EOR, enhanced soil recovery, and enhanced coal bed methane recovery with our project activities that we are pursuing in India and China for carbon capture demonstration. The one bottleneck is that there's not enough knowledge on utilizing the CO2 effectively with the EOR and ZBIM means. So that knowledge needs to be transferred quickly and effectively to India and China based uh, and supported by the U.S. Um, you force us to say one thing. <clears throat> I, I think there's the essence of what they've, uh, what they need to do in what they're already collaborating to do. But I think if you had to sort of pick one, you know, in particular, I think for the renewable space, which is a, you know, huge opportunity in India, you know, <clears throat> financing, uh, you know, it's true everywhere, but I think it's especially true in India. And it's not, um, I would totally agree, it's not grant kind of, you know, we'll give you money. I think it's actually uh, bringing some of the innovative financing model that, models that are already developing in lots of places, including in the U.S. and Germany, you know, <clears throat> to other, two places like India, because, uh, you know, frankly, I, I'm not sure anyone, maybe Bloomberg New Energy Finance is about the only one that can keep up with all the finance models, but, you know, every time you turn around, there's a new innovative way to finance, uh, you know, distributed solar in, in the United States, and if we can sort of bring some of those lessons to, you know, to India and figure out how they might fit within a, you know, different context, I think there's huge opportunities, but I think there's a lot of money sitting on the table that would love to invest in a, you know, 100 gigawatt, um, you know, goal um, is, is is a pretty big uh, market for lots of companies. I'm not sure I can really add much to the conversation except to say that I think India's problems in many ways are unique to India. Uh, so it, it's awkward for me to think we can take solutions that work here and drop them right there. That said, I think the, the role that the private sector plays in this is to try to support and facilitate uh, uh, programs in India that can help raise awareness and, and increase the expertise to solve some of those those issues. They may be non-technical, they may be market barriers, there may be other sort of structural issues that need to be addressed. And so what we've done, what United Technologies did when last year, we announced the, um, the formation of a center of excellence for energy efficient buildings in India, specifically together with Terry to address some of the very structural informational needs that are resident in India and how do, how do we uh, facilitate and raise awareness for information about energy efficiency that will help that market to expand. And that way, that's good not only for India and its growth trajectories, it's good for, for businesses that are resident in the U.S. because there, therein lies the, the trade relationship that we want to establish. I'm sorry to say that will have to be the last word. Please join me in thanking our panel. And we'll make room for the next.